Hello, hey. Dr. Tro. Hey, how are you? I'm trying to get uh, the camera placed here really nicely, but let's see what I can do. How's everything? Oh, everything's just fine. I'm very glad that you, you're here joining my Brazilian audience. Thank yeah. you so much for dedicating your time uh, here no, for thank us. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for everything you're doing. I know you guys are doing excellent things. I know you work closely with Jason and Megan and fasting and ketogenic approaches. So thank you for everything that you do. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> sorry about the angle here. Let's see, I got to get one of those, you know, awesome holders. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tro, so I'm yeah. going to introduce you just quickly to my, uh, my, my Brazilian audience. And then we're just going to talk about, because we have lots to talk about. I haven't translated the title for this, this live session. And the title is How to Regain Health, Ignoring the Food Pyramid. And Ooh, I think yes. you're a fantastic person to interview when we are talking about ignoring the food pyramid. So yeah. Dr. Tro, if you don't know Dr. Tro, he's a board certified physician in internal medicine and obesity medicine. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And... He's here to talk about um, a little bit of his personal history because it's very related to this topic. And also we'll be talking about everything you need to know, how to recover your health, ignoring the food pyramid that we've learned both in medical school and also for a lay person that have all, uh, also learned about that. So welcome, Dr. Tro, and you're most welcome to introduce yourself and start talking about your personal history Sure. Uh, first things first, can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, I can hear you just fine. Perfectly. Okay, great. First of all, it was a pleasure to meet you last year in uh, Low Carb Denver. We had a great time. Um, and, and that was the first time, you know, we kind of met each other and I've followed you since and everything that you do is so important. So uh, I want to say thank you for initiating this and thank you for everything you're doing. And uh, I don't think people realize in the impact social media has uh, to get very good quality advice. And you could be seeing patients, you could be talking to people right now, you could be doing things and to take half an hour out of your time to bring, uh, you know, to educate, you know, potentially hundreds of people at once, I really commend you for it. You know, nobody's gonna thank you. you know, maybe they thank you, maybe they send you a direct message, but you know, Uh, so I thank you because this sort of evangelical work needs to be done um, potentially. You know, and I think you probably know it more than other people what we're up against yes. um, because uh, they are outright lying. You know, they're outright lying and um, and or they're either lying or they're not thinking. So anyway, quickly about my story. I was a 350 pound doctor. I was a board certified uh, internal medicine physician. Uh, and my wife, about six, seven years ago, um, I had just diagnosed her dad with a uh, life threatening condition and we got him surgery and he did great. And my wife is much smarter than me. She's a, an amazing woman. And she went and she said, uh, well, you know, she knows that weight has been an issue, something I didn't want to talk about. And uh, she treaded very supportively and lovingly. And she said, you're a smart doctor. She knew how to play me. She said, you know, you scored on the 90th percentile on your board exam. You know, we know you're, you know, the chief resident in the Yale system. Like, why can't you go figure out this weight problem? Uh, just like you figured out the problem for my dad. And more specifically, she said, I, I almost lost dad. If I lose you, um, where, what will happen to me? What will happen to my kids? And, um, That was really the starting point. And it was more of an intellectual pursuit. So I was like, okay, this is going to be easy. What do we do if this was a drug? Look at the head-to-head -head trials, see which drugs do better, and go with that one. So I start looking into the medical literature. Like, I'm just going to pick. I'm an evidence-based doctor, board-certified in internal medicine. I'm going to follow the guidelines. I'm going to go to the head-to-head -head studies. Whichever drug, uh, whichever trial did better, I'm going to go with that one, whichever diet. And then one study, the A to Z study, one study after study, it's low carb does better. And I'm like, wait a second, what's going on here? Okay, because they told us more grains and more meals and all of a sudden low carb, your you people get less hungry, they stop eating and the, the number of meals goes down. I'm like, something's wrong here. So I read 
I want to say more than probably 1500 studies, nutrition studies. I read 300 books on nutrition. Okay. Because I'm, you know, my, my, my wife, she knows how to like just plant the seed to get me started. <laughs> and then I'm like, holy crap. They lied to us. They lied to us. It's all a fake. The pyramids are fake. Uh, eat more, you know, bread and starches is all a fake. <laughs> Fruit. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and you, exactly fruit. There's nothing wrong with fruit. Fruit might be quite healthy, okay? It may be quite healthy, and full fat yogurt may be quite healthy, and dairy might be healthy, and nuts might be healthy. But that doesn't mean it was healthy for me back then. And certainly abstaining from them, uh, uh, particularly fruit in the beginning, helped me suppress my appetite. Uh, you know, the sweet cravings went down uh, once I entered ketosis my appetite was suppressed and it was like dieting was effortless. Of course, you're a 350 pound doctor, you always wanna lose weight. I wanted to lose weight my whole life, you know? And if I could just eat less, I would have eat less. The smartest doctors in the Yale system came to me and said, why don't you just eat less? Why don't you just eat less? These are the smartest doctors in one of the most <laughs> prestigious system in the world. Okay, why don't you just eat less? Maybe there's a new drug coming out. Maybe we'll try that on you. Okay. So the problem is, uh, the problem is twofold. Doctors don't know any better and they have not been trained in how to address appetite. How do you eat less in a way that doesn't make you go bonkers? Okay. And, uh, and that's how my journey. And then I lost 150 pounds in the next three or four years. This is like five, six years ago and I've kept it off. Um, and, uh, I've got my certification in obesity medicine, um, because I can't do the, I can't practice the same way. I mean, you're there. Once you see, you cannot unsee, That's right? True. I mean, imagine you had to sell the pyramid now. Would you do it? You can't. Yes. You're right. right. So, uh, that's where, that's my story in a nutshell. Yeah. I, I really admire your work in Twitter because uh, I, I know you've had a lot of criticism by the way you're very blunt and I think you're excellent the way you, you answer all these um, affirmations that people are still trying to sell the pyramid. No matter what they do, they still offer the same bad advice for people that have tried. So I really like the way you talk about it and I, I understand uh, I have never been obese, but my family has a very bad um, history of type 2 diabetes. My mom has like better cell failure from type 2, but she's a bariatric patient and she, her pancreas doesn't work anymore. She's a type 1 now. And my grandma, uh, she had uh, kidney disease, failure, total failure as well. My grandma, great grandma had amputation. So When I started low carb, I was just reading how to lose weight, Gary Taubes. And then when I realized that everything we had in studies and everything we had 10 years from that time I was reading, I felt betrayed. So I understand the way you talk about, because I think it's a feeling of betrayal. And that's what drives me to like dedicate my time in social media to offer information for people that don't have access to read all those books we've read and to access medical um, publications as we do have this critical look right now. So I think it's very important that we talk about and especially with doctors that have been obese before. Um, it's like the greatest proof that we are also victims of bad advice. So there's so much we can talk about. And well, look, I, I, wa I want to say that there's nothing more, uh, I, you know, we have to get you on also our podcast because the story has recurred again and again with um, physicians, scientists, researchers, and uh, either it's their life was changed or it was their family's lives. Yes. Uh, and uh, we just had a great uh, guest on our podcast who talked about uh, her mother who suffered from migraines for 20 years, debilitating migraines, saw every single doctor in the world, you know, and nutrition was the answer. Yes, um, I had migraine as well. So my personal history is also like most doctors right now are affected to the way 
we eat because doctors are also humans and it's a pandemic. We know that our food is toxic, even for, for, for animals. So I really like the way you talk about how our food is called garbage and is affecting animals. So we're not different. So I think it's very uh, important that we talk about hunger because I wasn't sick when I started low carb, but I had this endless hunger that we get from carbohydrates. I, I think that we're going to discover a lot about food addiction because my, all my family, they are carb addicted. Um, and I was also, but I was so worried about diabetes that I wasn't obese, but I had this, like I have this brain chemistry that is mixed, uh, messed up. And I just know enough to keep away from it and keep my ketones very high. And so I don't experience this endless hunger. So can we talk about endless hunger? Yeah, yeah it's like my biography. <laughs> um, look, uh, some people manage the endless hunger very well. Maybe they have fear as a motivator. So p some people say, well, how is it that some people eat a little bit of Pop-Tarts and they stay a good weight? Well, maybe, anomalies. <laughs> right? Uh, no, they are anomalies. We know that uh, less than, you know, 12% of America is metabolically well, uh, meaning they don't have any of the components of metabolic syndrome. So they are truly less the minority of the population. But some people have a very potent, you know, particularly I've seen in, in uh, younger women, they have a very uh, strong social stigmas and the figure that they should have. So they have a very, and whereas men, it's like, you know, almost as if they don't have the same, well, it used to be, now there's social stigmas being placed on young men, but um, uh, there is an outside force kind of limiting weight. You know, I cannot tell you how many women come to my practice and say I've been dieting since age 11. Yes. Uh, and so this culture didn't exist in men, but is now coming into the forefront. Certainly I've been dieting since 11. Um, you know, so I think that there's outside pressures that can, to some extent, limit intake, right? Certainly, if you have a crazy breakup, what happens? You stop eating, right? If somebody gets sick in the family, what happens? You stop eating. But that's not a long term driver, right? It's an episodic and periodic driver of intake, right? So yes, you can be a bodybuilder and focus on what you eat for a certain period of time. But at the end of the day, your hunger will likely take over if it is not your, you know, 24-7 uh, profession. So the, the problem with our current medical system is the policies, the guidelines, and the approach to nutrition is mainly decided by, one, people who are metabolically healthy and have no appetite issue, and two, people who respond very well to this central uh, planning of weight management, which is not what the average person does. The average person responds to their hunger. Animals respond to their hunger. So you don't have a part of your brain that clicks when you hit 2000 calories and says you're done. Yes. You have a part of your brain that clicks when it's sated and it says you're done. So uh, using calories as a metric to guide obesity is actually counterintuitive. It's, it's it actually, I'm gonna say it's harmful, okay? I believe it's harmful while it does provide you, it's like going to a bum on the street and saying, you're losing money, you're losing money. That's great. It doesn't help them to, set, to, to remind them that they're losing money. That's what the calorie paradigm is. It shifts the blame to the person suffering the appetite issue and does not give them away to eat less. It just merely says eat less. And um, it does not give them a way to regulate a out of control appetite. It just merely says your appetite's out of control and you cannot regulate it. So the, the problem with the current messaging and the reason why I'm so against all of these people, uh, Yoni Friedhoff, who's been critical of Jason Fung, Bio, you know, uh, uh, Lane Norton has been very critical of uh, Nina Teitschultz, Gary Taubes, Jason Fung, and myself. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm very critical of this paradigm and this approach is because they don't realize how they're very harmful to the over two thirds. And, and furthermore, they don't recognize the power of carbohydrate and intermittent fasting. They believe that its effect is completely driven by weight loss, which we know is not true. 
Okay, we know that calorie for calorie, if you remove fructose from a diet, calorie for calorie, your liver fat will decrease. Mm -hmm. We know that calorie for calorie, if you remove carbohydrates, your blood sugar will improve. We know calorie for calorie, that metabolic syndrome will improve, okay, on a low carbohydrate diet. So that means forget about calories, forget about weight loss. And just recently, Dr. Lichtish with uh, Lichtash with uh, Jason Fung and Megan Ramos, they published a case report where uh, a patient lost no weight and their A1C was reduced by three. And I don't, I don't know if in Brazil you follow the same... Um, uh, we do, the A1C we do is just the milligrams per deciliter. Perfect, for... exactly, yes. So, uh, so all of your listeners will know it, it, a three-point reduction in A1C is amazing. That's yeah, about 100... Yeah. If it was a medication, it would be costing lots of dollars, but yeah. it's fasting, so they don't care. It's just a, it's just a, a case report. So well, so it is a case report, and, and it was an excellent case report, but it proved uh, that look, it's not uh, weight loss that's governing um, it, it, calorie for calorie. The issue is not regulated to rate, weight loss. So let's re recap: calorie for calorie, migraines are improved with a low carbohydrate diet. Calorie for calorie, you know, uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, fatty liver are yeah. all improved. Seizures are improved. So you have all of these things that specifically improve when you go low carbohydrate that are unique to low carbohydrate. But the convention will say that all diets are the same. And as long as you lose weight, this is an incorrect, not, uh, this is an incorrect scientifically it is terrible uh, messaging, it's, it's a lie, and yet it's constantly promoted. And who benefits? I think it's important to look, who benefits from saying every diet, you know, that's your fault, you have to manage your calories and um, balance your meals, who benefits? It's truly the drug companies and the food companies, at the end of the day, that benefit from this really perverted way of interpreting the scientific literature. So uh, it's, a, it's a shame and it's, it's a really, it's a system that keeps people in illness. And that's why I'm very passionate and I know you're passionate about the same thing. Um, I hope that, you know, I try to take something complex and make it simple, but it's, you know, it's not easy for the lay person to understand. Yes, uh, I always like examples because I know that most, um, I have many doctor friends that are lay persons hunger because we don't learn that in med medical school. So I think that even um, talking about scientific studies is very helpful here because I know there are a lot of, a lot of uh, professionals watching us right now and they're going to watch when we have subtitles. So um, I think it was a great answer. But I also like to talk about, uh, it's not with many doctors that I can talk like that. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to enjoy now. Uh, asking you to talk us a little about how uh, mild hypoglycemia acts in our brain and makes us hungry. Mm, so, excellent. Yes, this is one. This is a. Uh, never heard about it. Yeah. So uh, so we we talked. We we actually mentioned this in a recent blog post, and um, I suspect the reason why a low carbohydrate diet works. I, I always wondered. If somebody in my practice goes whole food plant based, okay, we we're not we're not uh, we will never take somebody who's interested and who cares about animals and tell them to go eat meat. But certainly some are strict vegetarian, have certain moral preferences, and we've hooked them up to continuous glucose monitors. They went from the modern diet to whole food plant based, and if you look at them on a CGM, uh, I wish I could draw, but I'm uh, gonna them here. Ah, perfect. Yes. Perfect. Have a joint. While yeah. you talk to us, I'll show them. Yeah. The so if you imagine something that looks very erratic, kind of up and down, that is what a standard diet looks like. And when a patient goes strict vegetarian uh, or uh, whole food plant-based and they eliminate, let's say, seed oils and refined sugars and refined flour, their, um, their blood sugar looks great. And they lose weight and they tell me I have no appetite. Now, the overwhelming majority of our patients um, do low carbohydrate approaches, which are very much animal based. And the same thing happens. 
right? They go uh, very low, low processed sugar, low processed oils, and their blood sugars look very flat. Like so, this. Yeah, exactly That's like me. that. Exactly That's like that. Yesterday. But yes. I have a photo of me after eating cake. Oh, geez. Exactly. Imagine that all day long. Right. And that's what the average person is doing. And oftentimes I wondered, and we all know this, okay, just to talk about the mild hypoglycemia. So now here we have two separate diets. And even if somebody comes to me and let's say they have um, like a real chocolate addiction, food addiction, I'll give them maybe a chocolate uh, protein shake and then say, look, if you really need chocolate, have your chocolate. Here's your chocolate. Okay. But it's low carb. Okay. And what happens to them is, all of a sudden their blood sugar looks flatter. And they come into me, each one of these separate things, the shake for breakfast, shake for lunch, and a real food dinner, or the person who is whole food plant-based, or the person who is low carb, they all come to me a week, two weeks, three weeks later, they say, my blood sugars are better, my triglycerides are down, we check the triglycerides, and they say that um, their hunger is down. And I'm scratching my head like, what the hell is going on here? Okay, it can't all be insulin. Insulin is the primary driver, I believe that. Okay, it's not all insulin. And so I turn to the medical literature. What is driving hunger? Why or why, what is drives it? And uh, there's a great study uh, in the Yale system where I did my training and it, it, what they literally did was a euglycemic, hypoglycemic clamp. They took people and they made their blood sugar 110 Okay, and they gave them a insulin drip, meaning they gave them insulin, a ton of insulin. And they said, this is gonna be it. Insulin is the only part of this. It's the big bad thing. We're gonna keep their blood sugar really high and we're gonna measure the parts of the brain and we know what's gonna happen. The junk food areas are gonna light up. The give me the sex drug and rock and roll areas are gonna light up. The addiction area is gonna light up. And we know it because insulin, that's the problem. And while it's one of the worst problems, you know, insulin and insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, uh, acutely on appetite, they did this study, they did it on thin people, they gave them a, a ton of insulin and nothing happens to their brain. Nothing, like they, they put them in a functional MRI, they look at it, a little part of the uh, addiction areas are lighting up, but nothing crazy. And then they said, you know what, it's not the thin people, it's not the metabolic, the healthy, this is the people who struggle with weight, let's get the metabolic syndrome people in, the obese people, we're gonna give them a ton of insulin and we're gonna measure, you know, Keep their blood sugar at 110. We're going to measure what happens in their brain. And again, a little bit more lights up, but not nothing, not, nothing much. So they're scratching their heads. They're like, you know, what's going on here? Insulin's supposed to make everybody hungry. You, what happens when you give somebody insulin? Your, your mom takes insulin. If, her, if you, she takes a ton of insulin, her blood sugar goes low. What does she say? She probably says, get me ice cream, get me chocolate, right? She feels weak. She feels sweaty. She's like, you know, I'm hungry, right? And it's not her control. She just... Her brain lights up and says, get juice, get, you know, um, it's just seeking food because it, that's the nature of the brain to protect itself, to seek out energy. So, um, but they, they literally gave a ton of insulin and nothing's happening. So they did the same study and said, let's just drop the blood sugar 20 points from 110 to 90, which you know is nothing. That probably happens when you go for a walk, right? Um, so they dropped the blood sugar from 110 to 90, and all of a sudden the, the uh, addiction areas of the brain are lighting up, right? To go from 110 to 90, now the, it's like the brain is on fire for food. And this made a lot of sense. And then fast forward to more recently, David Ludwig showed that if you have a high carb versus medium carb versus low carb meal, that two to three hours after that meal, there's a low total body energy, not just glucose, but also fat if you have a high carb meal. So let's think about this. Okay, lowering of blood sugar in the setting of high insulin activates the addiction areas of the brain, the parts that says eat more, right? We know every person that we give insulin to says, and their blood sugar goes low, they say, I feel weak, I feel hungry, get me Bread. ice cream, <laughs> graham cracker, cookie, orange juice, chocolate, jelly bean, whatever it is, right? So, um, well, let's just think about it practically. What happens two hours after eating pizza or three hours after eating pizza? You're eating We're cold calling. pizza yes. and it tastes better, right? Or what happens after we have Thanksgiving here or Christmas dinner or, you know, and what you, everybody's so full, they can't eat anymore. And then three hours later, they start picking leftovers. 
And then the pies come out, the desserts come out, maybe for you guys it's flan or other desserts, and everybody's eating all over again. Why is that? In the United States here, there's a Chinese food epidemic, and this is the, everybody knows this. If you tell them what happens three hours after Chinese food, you know, basically, you, I love Chinese food, no, nothing against my Chinese uh, compatriots, but, uh, but the food is so good, what happens? So you eat the food, you try not to eat the egg roll, you try not to eat the lo mein, and three or four hours later, you're eating cold leftovers and it tastes better. Why does it taste better? Why is the cold food three or four hours later tasting better? Why are you hungry if you ate so much? And that's driven not by what's in your stomach or the size, you could put a cinder block in your stomach. It doesn't matter, you could cut your stomach, you could take all sorts of weight loss medications at that moment when your blood sugar is going down in the setting of high insulin, when the total body energy is down, your brain is on fire for food. So this is uh, an important concept for patients to understand. Uh, and this is how um, low carbohydrate diets reduce hunger, I suspect, in conjunction with raising the you know, satiety hormones, neuropeptide YY, CCK, which we know calorie for calorie are upregulated on a low carb diet versus a low fat diet. So the bottom line here is if you want to be less hungry, have stable blood sugar, have ketones, and, um, and don't have low total body energy, which means being adapted to a low carb diet. So um, yes, I think that that mild hypoglycemia, and what happens? What happens to people going to the gym now, right? They eat a normal crap diet and they go to the gym. What happens three hours later? They're eating. Why are you eating? Because your blood sugar is plummeting. You're driven to eat, right? And you're not, when your blood sugar is plummeting specifically, you're not thinking, it's not the part of you that's like, oh, my mom you know, has diabetes. In my case, my mom both has diabetes and she's overweight. It's not the part of you that says, oh, I, there was a death in the family, oh, I'm gonna get sick. It's the innate part of the brain that says, get me awesome, right? And when that happens, don't expect to win on a diet. So when you're on a regular diet and you go to the gym and after two hours later, you're hungry, you know, don't expect to crave, you know, plain chicken and plain raw broccoli. Not gonna happen. Yes. Sorry, I know that was a, that's a long-winded answer. Does that answer more of a, does it provide a little, I know you knew this, but, uh, but hopefully the, 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 mm -hmm. it wasn't too complicated for the viewership. No, it wasn't at all. It was a great answer. And I'm gonna uh, keep on talking about this. Uh, something that you haven't mentioned, but uh, I think that the ketones are seen Signaling molecules also have a very interesting role on this, especially on binge, binge eating disorders. And I know you have a case report series uh, about that. I read it and congratulations about it. But I had a patient uh, yesterday that came after six months. She started with me. She's lost, uh, I think, 30, uh, 27 something kilos, only two kilos of lean wow. mass. Yeah, only two kilos of lean mass. Uh, no medications, she couldn't even uh, stand the metformin and uh, her home IR was 3.4. Wow. So she adapted really well and in six months she hasn't had any um, eating, uh, binge eating episode. So she responded very well and I haven't used on her exogenous ketones or MCT oil, but I would like to know your opinion on that because I think um, increasing the ketones in the beginning of the for binge eating disorders is a very promising therapy. And I'd like to know your opinion on that. Yeah, so uh, we use, I have no problem with it. I, I prefer my, you know, uh, theoretically I have no problem with it. Uh, I very much prefer to replace the foods that they cannot restrict. So pragmatically speaking, if the behavior, the reward seeking behavior is chocolate or ice cream, for me it was ice cream and chocolate. Sometimes it's potato chips. I'd much rather prefer replacing it with a low carb alternative and not having to tell them you can't have it, right? So if somebody tells me they're binge eating, it's always Nova 4 food. 100% of binge eating is always ultra processed food, okay? So, um, we will replace the foods with low carb versions. We'll give them time, we'll teach them tools to understand what's driving them to eat. And, and so I prefer the behavioral approach. 
and and there certainly is there is nothing wrong with leveraging the ketones for fuel for uh, both fuel and for potentially uh, stabilizing the brain. Yeah, the um, phase, I yeah, but we I prefer to use it. I've used uh, exogenous ketones out of maybe a thousand patients twice. Uh, okay. So we'll consider it, um, but I, I much prefer the education and the preparation uh, defenses, right? Why are you hungry? Why are you going to these foods? Explaining to patients and then giving them an alternative. And here in the States, there's an alternative for everything. And not that those foods are healthy. It just helps them stay low carb enough that we can start to mount ketones. And then we can wait for their appetite suppress while we support real foods and then push them into fasting. You know, um, so we've had a lot of success with that protocol. And the, the paper you talked about with this binge eating, it was one patient who literally could not stop eating pizza until it hurt. Okay, several times a week. And uh, another patient who would in the middle of the night go out and buy chocolate. Okay, so uh, and this has been going on for years. So rather than I, I like the idea of giving the patients a way out, like yes. here, you want your chocolate, here's chocolate, you know, you want the pizza, here's a way to make pizza. And they use it. They're like, what, really? A weight loss doctor telling me I could eat pizza? And then they eat it. The next day they come in, they're like, I've never felt so full in my life. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> because <laughs> if, you, if you calorie for calorie, you eat the same amount of energy with almonds, cheese, and butter, right, which is basically the recipe for a keto pizza versus a regular pizza, right, you will get full. I mean, the, the best way you can do it is take a look at it. So two slices of pizza, and I don't know if Brazilians like pizza or not, but certainly in America, they love pizza. But um, if you do count for two slices of pizza in New York is about 800 calories, not that I think it matters at all. But if we exchange that for eggs that's 10 eggs who would eat 10 eggs and if they ate 10 eggs how full would they be right so they come in after eating these low carb pizzas they're like i can't eat anymore <laughs> you know and i'm like great keep eating that pizza because it's making you full and then their that reward cycle is disrupted and then and they're full and their brains are full so uh, we've we've saw no need to really leverage exogenous ketones frequently. Instead, we like to replace it with fake foods. And the reason why the fake foods become, um, re I think, a long term tool is, you know, certainly they will be exposed to pizza. Certainly they will be exposed to chocolate. Certainly they will have family gatherings with desserts. And so preparing these things becomes a defense in the future. Uh, so I so I think it's a behavioral defense also. So that's my take on that. But certainly, theoretically, the role of exogenous ketones is there for appetite suppression. No, I think it's very. I, I always try to do the the this behavioral approach, but I also think that not everybody can be addressed like that. In Brazil, we don't have those fake low carb substitutes very available. Like if you go to a supermarket, you won't find uh, low carb pizzas. We have yeah. some very um, homemade low carb pizzas that are beginning to um, deliver uh, by, by internet, you can buy it, but you, you don't have that very accessible. So many of my patients like work with a bakery, but it's not Rosette's bakery, <laughs> it's like, yeah, 100% sugar bakery and they work with that and they say, well, I'm the head of my, my business. I, I manage sugar the whole day and I cannot give up my, my jobs. Yeah. What do I do? So in this special, um, in this special uh, occasions, I think that we need to know more about the impact of inducting the, the keto, the, the, the keto phase, the, the phase induction with something else to maybe help them um, clear their environment. Also patients that have family, they live with the family and the family eats sugar all day and they have those triggers all around the house. And part of the addiction doesn't even allow the person to get rid of the, of the, the, the triggers at home. Yeah. They, they get restless just by t telling them, well, you should at least 
uh, leave it not very easily available for you in case you go, you want you want to start until your ketones go up. So that was uh, that was my question, like to this specific. Yeah, I, no. Let's put it this way. So uh, we'll we'll definitely the I think using exogenous ketones, particularly after a a carb excursion, there may be utility in that to like kind of get back quicker. Uh, so there may be utility there. Um, and I, I think ultimately it, it's, you know, our approach, we just published our uh, six like main defenses that we work on with every patient. And I really, if there's a healthcare provider here who wants to know how is it that we get, how do is it that we, uh, you know, deploy a lifestyle to a patient, we've basically given our model. It's for free. Okay. It's how we approach it. And the key cornerstones are, you know, educating the patient, again, awareness, right? Why are they, what's driving their intake? And, you know, is what, how, how strong of a component, uh, how strong is their addiction, let's just say, okay? Or the cravings or the intake, you know? Then we try to prepare for that moment where the baker is standing in front of the chocolate, you know, or the sugar. We try to prepare for that moment with their, uh, you know, keto uh, uh, replacements if they can. Okay, and certainly the next step will be self-advocacy, community, and support, meaning like, why are you doing this, right? And they, they have to, you cannot win when you're staring at, you know, pizza and cookies and expecting to be hungry, staring at those things and not eat them. That's not a winning solution, okay? You're never going to win that. Long-term, you won't win that. Short-term, you may win that, but you probably won't. So you, you know, no other animal, if you, if you have a pet, you know this, you put food in front of that animal. If you have a dog, what do they do? They eat, of right? So you cannot be a hungry animal in front of food that tastes good, certainly that you're addicted to and expect to win, okay? So um, if you, so making the alternative and putting it in every environment where you're at risk is critical in that beginning part. Once they have ketones, it's kind of like, it's much easier for them. And once the blood sugar is stable, it's much easier for them. And certainly I think exogenous ketones could play a factor there. We haven't really experimented with it as much, but maybe we'll consider it a little bit more now. I certainly see the role in it, but ultimately I think uh, learning those defenses, you know, this, the next defense is self-advocacy, right? So, you know, why are you here? Why did you pay a lot of money to come see me? Why did you watch all my YouTube videos and podcasts? right? What is driving your reasoning? And then the other, you know, one is community and support. Fine. Okay, you can't make that happen. But maybe there's somebody else struggling with you around you. Okay, that could be an ally for you. Maybe that there's a loved one you care about in their home. And if you express your vulnerability, I have a real problem. I need your help. Maybe you'll help them too. Maybe you'll get their help at least. Okay, I mean, um, so being a little vulnerable and open with your struggles can cultivate a community for you and we can't all do it alone, right? And this is the point of a coach or a doctor or somebody, right? So th these are all very critical. And I think that community and support becomes something important in terms of defense. And then the other part of it is not just the impulse control, but the, the which is a part of, uh, uh, you know, kind of defending against these things happening, but okay, what went wrong that time for that baker? right, who's there and stressed out and overworked and staring at cookies. You know, which one of those defenses would have worked there? If she made, you know, thousands of cookies and put them in the freezer and the minute she wanted a cookie, she could go have one, would that have worked? Nine times out of 10, it will work, right? Or if she, you know, talked to her family and said, look, this is one of the most hardest struggles I've had in my life and I need your help. You, you know, I need your help doing this. I cannot do it without you. It's hard for me. If this was alcohol, you wouldn't bring alcohol home. So if you cultivate that community and support, maybe that would have been a win. So that tenacity part of the defense system, which is going back and analyzing, you know, with help, sometimes I, I, it always help is needed. Which one of those could be built to prevent something like that happening? And certainly there's a role for pharmacologics whether it's ketones, whether it's appetite suppressive drugs, surgeries, all of that, that can be a tool. Um, sometimes it's as simple as drink two bottles of seltzer. You know, you won't want to eat much after two bottles. Of, sometimes it's as simple as call me. I will talk to you. 
we'll talk it out. Talk to a health coach. Let's walk you through what you do. If you're vulnerable, if, you, if, if this was a car and your car had a flat tire, you would call the company to come help you with your car. So why aren't you calling me in that time? My appetite is out of control. I need help. You paid a lot of money for me. You're paying a ton of money to, to, to see me. Why would you not reach out to me in your moment of need? Yeah, so that's... so uh, I think making the, eliminating the shame is big. Eliminating the barriers to developing community and support is big. We will be your community and support. Reach out to me. So I think um, I favor that, uh, you know, our defense, uh, our layered defense system. Um, but certainly we use everything from ketones to medications, I'd say very rarely, less than 5%. Okay, but certainly we've used ketones, certainly we've used medications, and sometimes even surgery. Um, but they have to have, you know, a, 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 the, the t main tenants in line. You know, they have to have, you know, displayed a key understanding of their appetite hunger. And are they able to uh, uh, kind of employ basic measures before we expose them to something, you know, uh, outside of kind of their own, you know, uh, uh, outside of their own merits, I guess. Yes. And the sad part is, is that many of my patients have never heard about food addiction and they don't uh, they don't face processed food as something that puts them into risk. So uh, one of the first questions I do is like, do you have lots of processed food in your, in your cupboard? Because if you do, when you're stressed out, you come, come home from work, you're surely going to be um, tempted and no one beats cortisol and <laughs> food. No, you're absolutely right. And again, how does cortisol work, right? It makes you less insulin sensitive and it drops your blood sugar, right? It, it first raises it and then, and then the, you have the back end. Nobody's ever hungry for food when they're being chased by a bear and adrenaline and cortisol is pumping. That's not when, you know, in the middle, it's when you're coming back home, when you get back home, when you've had, you know, a low carb dinner and now your blood sugar is going even lower and it's now nine o'clock and you're staring at dark chocolate. OK, and I'm saying it like it's easy for me because I live this life every single day. OK, I know exactly what's going on. So this is and 90 percent, uh, sorry, 100 percent of binge eating. OK, and that occurs at night is with processed food. Right. 100 percent. Let that sink in. It is a reward driven process by fluctuations in blood sugar in relation to stress hormones and relaxation and conditioning. 100% is reward-seeking behavior. And now okay. comes another question. As you're an ob obesity medicine, do you still attend to conventional, um, conventional obesity, obesity medicine uh, convention? Do you still attend? Yeah, I attend and I criticize. How do they talk about this, what we're talking about right now? Because no. that's they are shit. blind. They are blind. They don't know. And when I go there... I am, they call me, they say, please stop putting out uh, critical tweets, please. No, I'm not kidding. The organizations call me, email me, text Instead me. Instead of their... inviting you to talk, they ask you not to tweet. That's... They ask me not to tweet and not to <laughs> this. But you know what? Uh, we have another study out on severe triglycerides. We're attacking everything that they said we couldn't do. You have an eating disorder, you cannot restrict, BS. You have high triglycerides, you cannot do low carb, BS. And you wait till you'll see our next case study, uh, a case series. This will be absolutely amazing. And it will be uh, on lowering LDL without reducing saturated fat. So without reducing awesome. saturated fat. So uh, this will be, um, you know, we will, we will attack them with, with the medical literature. Uh, just as Jason Fung has done, and, and I'm sure you're working on these, and hopefully we can collaborate. And uh, we have to, we have to meet them where they where they need it, and that will be in the medical literature. And so we're happy to do that uh, and provide that service for them. That's excellent. Um, for one last question, I know you're out of time. Um, uh, what would you say to a lay person if they ask you that, are we uh, doomed to be hungry for the rest of our lives and regain weight? Is there a solution? Wow. 
Uh, six years in, I'm still struggling. Six years in, after the six packs, after the everything, the scale stops moving. Okay? The scale stops moving. Uh, so you cannot hold the scale as your moral compass. You, this is a chronic issue. As long as you're alive, you'll be driven to eat. It's like, you know, it's funny, you know, people say, how long will I have to deal with this? If I can turn the switch off in the brain to say you're not hungry, wouldn't, like, I'd be, I'd be a billionaire. Right? I'd be a billionaire. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's like saying, you know, when will I stop finding my husband or wife or the opposite sex or the same sex? When will I stop finding them attractive? <laughs> like maybe when you're dead, okay? You know, so um, so no, this is a chronic, it's not a chronic disease, it's just a chronic issue. As long as your dog is alive, will you expect them to eat when you put food in front of them? Okay, so uh, yes, this is forever. And not get used to it, but enjoy the journey. You will learn about your appetite along the way. And it's critical for long-term success to see what works and what doesn't work. And, and um, it's like saying, when will I stop needing to make money? You know, I, maybe never, probably never. So this is not much different. When will I stop needing to take care of my car? Never, Perfect. never, you know? So I hope that uh, it does not mean your hunger will remain with you. It will, it, it's like taming a wild horse. It's like taming a wild horse. You can, you, if you, you know, take good care of it, groom it, pat it on its back, put the saddle on, be gentle. Maybe you can ride together for a long time. At some point, if you're really nasty to it, it's going to kick you off and kick you off and you're going to get hurt. So you better get, cultivate a good, long-lasting relationship because you're in this for the long haul. Just like that movie, A Brilliant Mind with, uh, Russell Crowe that he's like he learns how to deal with his uh, imaginary friend and that's how like he's not cured he's just uh, accepted that he has a friend and no one sees him and he yep. walks with it and he he copes with it well I think it's important to talk about this because social media also in the keto and low carb community they talk about uh, success cases as if it was a magical pill, like you- Yeah, correct. You it's not, it's hard. It's hard and look, I'm the magical pill, right? You look at my picture and like, look at that guy and look at where he is now and you know, um, it is hard. It is not easy and it's, make it fun. This is fun. This is your body, what drives it? You know, you have to learn. Why am I hungry? Why am I? eating, I just ate a low carb meal. Why am I eating nuts or chocolate afterwards? Why is it I'm hungry? I usually, I fast every day, but I can't do it on Saturday. Why? Ask these questions. Just keep asking these questions. Why am I hungry? And look for those answers. Why, how, what did I do good this week? How did I fail? These are the most important things you can ask yourself, not, not anything about calories. You know, if you want this journey to be lifelong, my, uh, my, my suggestion is you follow these questions and not what they told you. That's perfect. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, thank you so Always much. Always a pleasure. Maybe we can exchange. We, why don't we get you on uh, the Low Carb MD podcast? I'll reach out to you. I'll send you an email. I think you know, we should continue to climb. Maybe on research also, if you have any interest. Oh, yes. Uh, because I have many patients here like success cases and I wish I, I had reported better because I think what you're doing is amazing. We need to show them uh, our results with fasting and keto and we have to fight back the same way with, great with data and publications. Uh, yes. If you haven't seen this track, this right paper, I'm telling you, look at it. It's, we, we, just, we just published you know, two or three days ago um, I've yeah. only seen the tweets, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, but yeah. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I have to step out, but this was awesome. Yes. We're going to, we'll do it again. And, and hopefully um, uh, we can get you on maybe within the next month or two, if you're open to it. Okay. It will okay. Be All right. Have a good Thank one. You. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> nice yeah. to see you. All right. Bye.